Hello, my name is Christine Bantlo. I'm a, a director of the uh, Division of Neurobiochemistry at the Biocenter of the Medical University of Innsbruck. And today I'm going to talk about the myelination in the uh, central and in the peripheral nervous system. Well, what is myelination? It basically refers to a process by which uh, glia cells that are very abundantly present in the uh, central but also in the peripheral nervous system and a very special type of glial cells produces an insulation sheath that is basically called myelin. Well, myelin that covers the axons of some neurons, in particular very long fiber tracts, leaving the brain going down along the spinal cord, for example, uh, motor fiber tracts, right? They are highly myelinated. And myelin is nothing else than helping to speed up the transmission of neural impulses. Well, if you look at this uh, graph here, you also see that myelination is occurring relatively late in development. It's long after neuronal proliferation, it's long after neuronal migration, and it's even with some areas in the brain after synaptogenesis. So if here is indicated the date of birth, you see that prenatally only little myelination occurs. It basically starts first in the spinal cord and then moves on to the hindbrain and to the midbrain. And the last brain areas that are myelinated and this reaches out throughout the adolescence, i.e. to the 20th uh, year, is the forebrain. So we can say that myelination occurs late in development and continues during childhood and puberty. Well, myelination is the main cause of the increase in a child's brain size, apart from proliferation also of the astrocytes, which are a number, another type of glial cells. Well, if you look in the human brain, in the first four years of life, the brain increases to 80% of its adult weight. And this is due to myelination of specific fiber tracts. Well, you can easily imagine if myelin, so the sheath that is formed around the axons of the fiber tracts, that is so important for conduction velocity, you can easily imagine that any effect that perturbs myelination, either prenatally or also postnatally, can have deleterious effects. And the best described effects we do know is malnutrition during the late phases of uh, the human development in utero, or also exposure to ethanol perinatally and postnatally affects myelination often irreversibly. Well, what is the impact of myelination? Here is a nice summary. Here you see again, this is fertilization. We have proliferation, we have migration of neurons, we have uh, also synaptic contacts and so on. This is myelination. And you can see that it really stretches out throughout puberty, throughout childhood, 
even into 20, 25, 30 years, it's going on the myelination. And you also see that myelination is occurring in a slow process in a mosaic-like fashion coming, as I mentioned, from the spinal cord over, via the hindbrain, the midbrain, to the frontal brain. So myelination is late in the forebrain and it's slower than the limbic system, which means that what is the limbic system good for? The limbic system is our emotional response system, and it's good for better judgment, impulse control, decision-making, social interactions. That is what the frontal lobe, the forebrain, is responsible for. So if there is a less well-established connection between the limbic system and the frontal brain, and you can see here there is late, 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 there is myelination only occurring in the frontal brain. This may explain why there is impulsiveness and also risky behavior, emotional outrages in adolescence. Simply because there is less well-established interaction between the frontal brain and also the rest of the brain, and most importantly in this case, the frontal brain interaction with the limbic system. Another aspect why delayed myelination can have an effect also in a disease-making process, which is uh, discussed recently, is for the onset or the possible onset of schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a disease that usually occurs between 20 and 30. And the male population is at higher risk as the female population. And one of the ideas of the hypothesis is that one saw that there is a decreased myelination in schizophrenic brain samples in comparison to healthy. Well, what are the myelinating cells? We already mentioned these are glial cells. And these glial cells are specialized cells in the central nervous system, but also in the peripheral nervous system. So the cells in the central nervous system are called oligodendrocytes. And these oligodendrocytes are responsible for the myelination of fiber tracts. These oligodendrocytes themselves need to mature first because they are derived from small progenitor cells which are derived from stem cells in the brain and they are highly proliferative cells. They are migratory and they express certain molecules on their cell surface. These little bipolar cells can then slowly differentiate into so-called pro-oligodendrocytes, which still are not capable of uh, myelinating an axon, although they start already to put out processes, but they are still not enabled to wrap their processes around the axons. Because they need to undergo another differentiation stage where they then are able to 
mature in the sense that they become fully myelinating oligodendrocytes, and here they are depicted in a certain stage where they are really mature. So all this means that from precursor cells, these cells need to mature and differentiate into fully myelinating cells that can recognize axons that need to be myelinated. So this differentiation process is also something that occurs perinatally and long into postnatal stages of the human brain development and also of the spinal cord. Well, the myelinating cells in the peripheral nervous system are of another type, and they are called Schwann cells. And these Schwann cells also come from a different source, and they are neural crest-derived Schwann cell progenitors, which means they also come as progenitor cells, and they migrate over the surface of the neural tube and then start to differentiate in a similar manner as also the oligodendrocyte precursor cells needed to differentiate. And the differenti differentiation factors that they need are causing them to stop to proliferate and they then already settle around axons and start to enwrap in, in their immature form axons as bundles. But the more they mature, the more they also single out these axons and enwrap some of these axons individually. So the Schwann cell precursor cells are also migratory cells. And this is important because they need to migrate along the axon in order to myelinate the axon. So many, many of these Schwann cell precursor cells settle down at axons at given intervals and then once they are associated with axons, they then fully mature and they also tightly associate with axons and uh, with nerves and start to myelinate these axons. So these immature Schwann cells that are found in nerves that have acquired the basic tissue relationship of adult nerves. So it needs to be a signal then provided by the axon that tells the Schwann cells that they should start to wrap a myelin sheath around the axon which means that this tight communication between the immature Schwann cell and the axons is necessary that they really start myelinating because they need a signal from the axon. So myelinating occurs only in Schwann cells that by chance envelope large diameter axons. Schwann cells that ensheath small diameter axons, which are smaller than one micrometer diameter, they progress to become mature but non-myelinating cells. So the Schwann cells do differentiate, but they don't myelinate. Rather, they enwrap a bundle of axons 
so-called Remark bundles and uh, become so-called non-myelinating Schwann cells. So similarly, as we have seen now for the Schwann cell axon interaction, the same idea holds true for the oligodendrocyte. So the oligodendrocyte as a precursor form is uh, running through a probably intrinsic program that uh, helps it uh, precursor form to migrate and also to proliferate, to settle down, recognize the axon, to uh, along then the axon, and then start to myelinate. But it also, apart from this intrinsic program, it requires a close interaction and also some support from the axon. So again, as what we have seen for the Schwann cell axon interaction, the axon, so the neuron, also provides factors and information for the oligodendrocyte precursor cells to proliferate, to migrate, but also to differentiate. And then the final signal is to myelinate. And as we have seen in the previous lecture, oligodendrocytes, in contrast to the Schwann cells, can myelinate several axons by putting out several processes, whereas Schwann cells can only enwrap one axon and not several ones. So this is also depicted here, where you see that the oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system can enwrap several axons, whereas the Schwann cells can only enwrap one axon, and it needs several Schwann cells to enwrap one axon along its length. Well, if you look at the myelination in the central nervous system and also in the peripheral nervous system more closely, you begin to realize that, of course, myelination is driven by different cell types. So oligodendrocytes do it in the central nervous system and Schwann cells do it in the peripheral nervous system. So it may not be at odds that there are differences in the way they form myelin, and also later you will see also the composition of the myelin is different. So the oligodendrocytes, for example, they have the possibility with their long processes to ensheath several axons of different neurons. And also they can have with two processes, for example, in rep one axon. So they have the possibility to basically have different axons and also several internodes per axon. Well, the Schwann cells, however, in the peripheral nervous system, they can myelinate only a single internode in a single axon, which means that one needs several Schwann cells, as depicted here, the cell body of the Schwann cell that puts its processes around the axon and forms the myelin sheath in order to completely myelinate a given axon throughout its length. What you also see is that the neuronal cell bodies and also the dendrites of the uh, cell bodies in the central but also in the peripheral nervous system are never myelinated. It's only the axon. And we already have said that not all axons are myelinated. So it's the larger fibers that are myelinated. And we will come to that later on. And we also have said that Apparently, the average diameter of an axon that does get myelinated is 
one micrometer, which tells you already that the dendrites are smaller than one micrometer, and not all axons are also as large as one micrometer. For example, mossy fibers in the uh, hippocampus are not myelinated. So if you also now look at a uh, cross-section, then you see here the axon, you see here also the cell body, and you see that the oligodendrocytes, but also the Schwann cells, have really truly wrapped their processes, their plasma membrane, very tightly around the axon, and that there is very little space between the different layers of the ensheathment. And this is seen even better in a picture here, an electron microscopy picture through the longitudinal here and also the cross-section here. And you can see that the oligodendrocyte, and this holds also true for the Schwann cells, wraps around the axon many, many times and forms very thin layers of membrane where there is very little cytoplasm in between. So it's a very, very compact space and uh, this greatly also helps to seal the axon off from the rest. And this is in the end, here you see a uh, picture of many of these axons, and you find myelinated, unmyelinated, and you also find thickly myelinated and thinly myelinated. So some have only a few wrappings. And the number of wrappings apparently is also determined by the size of the diameter. So the larger the diameter of the axon, the larger, the thicker also the myelin sheath. The thinner, the thinner the myelin sheath. If it's beyond, at below one micrometer, then these axons are not myelinated. In the peripheral nervous system, we said that some of these axons then are lumped together and then a non-myelinating Schwann cell is wrapped around it. This is something we do not find in the central nervous system. Well, I also mentioned that the composition is different of the myelin, not in its thickness per se, but in its molecular composition. So if you look at a uh, Schwann cell myelin and an oligodendrocyte myelin, it looks basically similar on the, uh, on the electron microscopy. But if you then look at the different proteins, then there are differences. So myelin is nothing else than a number of proteins that either reside in the plasma membrane of the oligodendrocyte or of the Schwann cell, or are also uh, attached to the plasma membrane. And if you look at these proteins, which have been identified over the years, then you find proteins that are exclusively present in the per peripheral nervous system, like PMP22 or P0, which are transmembrane proteins, or also here proteins that are exclusively found only in the central nervous system, like uh, myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, MOG. Nevertheless, there is a number of proteins that are in common and shared between the PNS and the CNS. So this is interesting also from an evolutionary point of view because the Schwann cells, as we said, 
are derived from another cellular source, the neural crest, than the oligodendrocyte. Yet, they make the same job, they perform myelination with a similar degree of uh, a shared proportion also of common proteins. Yet, they also have their specificity. Well, besides these proteins, that are specific for myelin and rarely occur elsewhere, there are also a number of uh, specific lipids that one finds in myelin sheath. So myelin is very enriched in specific lipids, apart from the proteins that you find depicted here. So what is myelin in the end doing? We said it's important for conduction velocity. So let's have a look at these areas here where there are no myelin. So there is basically a naked axon where the myelin sheath of two Schwann cells or also of oligodendrocytes meet each other with their microvilli here. But there is an area where we also said in the previous lecture that astrocytes, for example, can make contact in the central nervous system with the naked axon at the nodes of Ranvier. So what are these nodes of Ranvier? So they are basically gaps between sections of myelination. And they occur in the peripheral nervous system and they also occur in the central nervous system. Well, they are considered as booster stations. So they give rise to strong depolarization. Yeah? This is due to the fact that at these regions, at the node of Ranvier, there is an accumulation of specific channels, in particular sodium channels and in particular potassium channels. So this high concentration of these voltage-gated ion channels will help to boost the conduction speed approximately a hundredfold. So this is where depolarization occurs and also hyperpolarization. We will see that in a minute. So the nodes of Ranvier are important for the propagation of nerve impulses along an axon. So these exposed parts of the nodes of Ranvier where there is no myelin allow saltatory conduction velocity. Basically then the myelin, this insulation sheath of an axon, prevents ions from leaking out across the plasma membrane. So at the nodes of Ranvier, we have the possibility for depolarization because there is the accumulation of voltage-gated ion channels. So if we look at this even more closely, then we find here the node where we said this is a concentration of specific voltage-gated ion channels, right? And the node for the peripheral nervous system is in contact with microvilli of the Schwann cells or by perinodal astrocytes in the central nervous system. In addition, if you now look here, we see that there are regions next to the node which are subdivided into a paranode region and a juxtaparanode region, which also play important roles in the conduction velocity, but this is something I don't want to go into detail. 
Yet I would like to point out that there is another difference between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Not only because astrocytes are contacting via their end feet to the node, whereas the microvilli of the Schwann cells do that at the node, but here the peripheral nervous system has also something else in addition which we do not find in the central nervous system, and this is the basal lamina. And these are proteins, primarily extracellular matrix proteins, which are produced by the Schwann cells themselves and which are accumulating and forming a layer around the myelin. And this is, becomes important because if you, for example, consider an uh, axonal damage which leads to the uh, demyelination of the axon, then in the central nervous system, this means that the axon is completely naked, whereas in the peripheral nervous system, the axon is still surrounded by the basal lamina, unless this basal lamina is also uh, not intact anymore. But many so-called demyelinating diseases have an effect on the demyelination of the axon, but they leave in the peripheral nervous system the basal lamina intact which sometimes can have very beneficial effects in the sense that these basal lamina having high concentrations of extracellular, extracellular matrix molecules, in particular of laminin, this is supporting then the regeneration of injured nerve fibers in the peripheral nervous system. But the absence of the basal lamina is also uh, in the central nervous system is uh, therefore not supporting. Well, again, let's have a look at this saltatory conduction velocity that I mentioned. So here you see in green depicted the myelin sheath surrounding the axon. This is here at the node of Ranvier, and here is another node of Ranvier. So a stimul stimulus occurs, it is then leading to a depolarization of the axon. The sodium channels that are accumulating here open, and an action potential is generated, so there is an increase of positive charges it within the axon, whereas the normal resting potential of the axon is negative. So now this action potential travels within the axon. We said the myelin sheath prevents that the ions are leaking out. So this is quickly transported along then the axon, right? And some current is generated by the action potential and uh, passively leaks out to the next node of Ranvier. And that what we then see is that the passive current depolarizes, depolarizes the no at the node and an action potential is generated again. So here you see the polarization, the hyperpolarization, the after polarization, and then you see the next signal propagation of an action potential along a myelinated axon. So this is basically speeding up the system enormously. And you can also understand and appreciate why it's called saltatory conduction velocity, because it jumps basically from one node from one node of Ranvier to the next one. So myelinating, myelinated axons have a much faster conduction velocity than 
unmyelinated. And you can imagine that the effects of a demyelinating disease, for example, multiple sclerosis, right, that the conduction velocity is heavily affected if the axons are demyelinated. So here you have an intact axon as we have seen it in the CNS. The oligodendrocytes are wrapping their myelin sheath around this uh, particular axon. The uh, astrocytic end feet, they are forming contacts with the nodes of Ranvier and in the background, we have the resident microglial cells. If there is a demyelination occurring, then we have several effects. And one effect is that we then have an activated microglial cell, which is no longer resident, and it's uh, starting to chew up here the, uh, the myelin and uh, migrating towards the demyelinating area and it's cleaning up basically the axon from the rest of the myelin. You then have singular contacts only of the astrocyte and feet at the former nodes of Ranvier, but of course because this myelin integrity, the axon glia interaction is uh, disrupted, therefore also the axonal conduction velocity is tremendously decreased. And this explains also why demyelinating diseases like multiple scler sclerosis, but also other diseases, and also in particular neuropathic diseases, patients do have problems sometimes walking or also in sensation and are eventually then uh, wheelchair bound. Well, I hope that I gave you an overview of the onset of myelination, the cell types necessary for myelination in the peripheral and in the central nervous system, and the progression of myelination that occurs in the brain in particular over several years and goes along to some extent also with synaptic plasticity. Thank you very much.